The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Uh, okay, guys, okay. I guess I'll get started. So, uh, I guess one quick announcement is, uh, so I guess everyone has taken a look at the prizes. If you can take a look at the prizes, and especially if you're near the top and expect yourself to be getting some prizes. So, we haven't announced the final ordering yet because it would also depend on, like, the homework. And then we'll decide, you know, how much... It'll mostly just be number of points, but we might give a bit of weighting to people who have, like, a high points per game or something. Uh, so, but if you're, you know, if you think you have a decent chance of getting prizes, it'd be good if you looked them over, you know, if you need to research who this, like, Mike McDonald guy is, how much is his coaching worth, you can do that beforehand so that people don't take, like, forever deciding which prize you want on Friday. Okay, so I'm going to get started then. So this is going to be the last class I'm going to teach. So next, the final class on Friday is going to be guest lectured by Bill Chen. Um, so I want to go through sort of an in-depth combinatorial hand analysis of a cash game hand, go very in-depth on, you know, a very a hand where you have deep stacks and there's a lot of action and there's a lot of deduction that can take place. And then I'll sort of finish with some general poker stuff and answer any question you guys might have about, like, the poker economy, how certain things work, the history of poker. I'm happy to answer whatever questions. Okay, so... First, we'll do something more technical and more practical to the game. So an in-depth combinatorial hand analysis in cash games. So I'm going to look at the following hand. And the board is visible. It's good. OK. Um, so, this, so this is a cash game. This is no longer a tournament now. And everybody has 100 big blinds. So the blinds are 1, 2. And everyone starts with 200. So it's 100 big blinds. The cutoff opens through 6, and we have 8, 7 suited on the button. And when it's this deep stacked, so in a tournament, this might not be a good situation to call because it just puts a lot of risk on you to bust, and also you're not really that deep stacked. But here with 100 big blinds, we can really realize a lot of our implied odds given that we're both in position and we have a hand that plays very well, a suited connector that can make straights and flushes. So we decide to call, and the big blind also calls. Okay, so the flop is 10-8-6 with, with a club, and the cutoff continuation bet's 14. Um, so one thing I'll talk about first is, you know, continuation bet sizing. So I've said a bit about this, but um, I wanted to talk a bit more about bet sizing. And it's really just, this is really just a review of what I've been talking about all class. It's the same principles when deciding your flop and turn bet sizing. So, you know, you don't want to bet so small that your opponent has the odds to call with anything. But you don't want to bet so big that you're risking a lot of chips when you're bluffing. And also, if your raise size commits your entire stack anyway, like if you're roughly, let's say, betting 40% or more of your remaining chips, then you might as well go all in if it's the flop or the turn, because you probably aren't going to fold with, like, given that your hand is good enough to put in 40% of your chips, you probably have, have enough equity that you're okay putting in 100% of your chips. Um, yeah, remember that raising their bet gives them the option to re-raise, so that's always an incentive against raising a flop bet. Um, the sizing should be bigger on dry boards and smaller on dry boards. We talked about this, and you want to bet, bet a bit bigger when you're out of position. So he's kind of out of position here against us, and he bets 14 into 19, which is a reasonably big bet, but I think it's fine. So with our hand here, 8, 7 of clubs, I think we definitely don't want to be folding. Uh, so let's talk about the differences between raising and calling. So we decide to call, and so what's the, what's the, what's the analysis? So we're definitely not folding. Um, raising, I think, is a bit suicidal when we have a medium strength hand that can play well in position on a lot of turns, and we have a backdoor flush draw, and our straight draw is very legitimate when there's no flush draw out there. So we decide to just call. We, we have to be a bit worried about a big blind check raise, but I think it's, it's okay. It's not that big of a deal, especially when there's no flush draw. So the big blind folds, and on the turn is the queen of clubs, and he bets 30. Okay, so this is sort of a tougher decision now and than the flop, I'd say. So let's, let's analyze this. So he bets 30 into 47. We got 180 behind, which is about four times the pot. 
and we've got we've got a pretty bad hand right now. We still we still have a pair, and we have lots of chances to hit a straight or hit a flush or hit like three of a kind or hit two pairs. So so tons of outs, tons of river cards that help us. And so what are the benefits of each? Okay, so so I think it's fairly clear we're not going to fold here with this much equity. So what what are the benefits of calling? Um, well, we get to see the river for sure, right? If the river is a club, then it's we don't want to like fold in situations and not see the river when it could be a club, which is the best card for us essentially. Um, we yeah, so we really want to see the river because yeah, if we raise, then maybe they could re-raise all in, and then we would have to fold. So that's that's one clear benefit. And another sort of benefit is we already have a pair to start with. So, you know, we don't really need to bluff to win the hand, right? So this is something I've been talking about a lot, too. You, you don't really want, need to, if you, your hand, you don't need to raise to um, win the hand because you already have a pair, then it's, there's a lot more incentive to call. So what are some benefits of raising? Well, if you get him to fold something like pocket jacks, if we think he might have, like, pocket jacks, it can definitely get him to fold some better hands. Um, and we can like bet the river and win a bigger pot when we hit, and we can also maybe make some bigger bluffs when we miss. So we'll go through a more detailed analysis in a bit, but I, I think calling, I like calling in this situation. I think with a draw that has no showdown value, like say I had nine five of clubs instead of eight seven of clubs, which has a pair, I think I would raise because for two reasons. One is I like I would need to bluff the river anyway if I miss the river. So if I raise now, I just give myself a chance to win the pot right now. And another benefit of raising is that I can um, I, I'm not that unhappy if he goes all in because my draw is sort of less strong than eight seven of clubs is. Um, okay, and then yeah, maybe with a hand like ace jack of clubs, I would raise just because we can maybe get it in against weaker flush draws. Okay, so, so yeah, so this is a sort of a general principle that I haven't really talked about for playing on turn, flops and turns, is in general, I mean, this sort of goes along with most of the stuff we've talked about in this class, but in general, when you have like stone cold nuts and when you have weaker draws, you sort of want to, you, you want to be the one, you want to be betting and raising in a way such that your opponent gets the last bet in. So I'm talking about like, you know, so one person is always going to go all in first, right? Like if you're raising each other or betting and raising, um, one person is going to go all in first and the other person basically has to decide whether to call or fold and play for your stack. So if you have the stone cold nuts, then you sort of want to be the person having your opponent go all in first, because obviously you have a very easy decision. You just call and you're going to win. Um, on the other hand, if you have like a weaker draw, which is essentially your bluff, right? Because we don't want to be bluffing with absolutely nothing. We want to be bluffing basically with our weaker draws. That it's also an easy decision because, like, if let's say we have a gut shot straight draw, so we have a four outs only, we're not that sad if our opponent goes all in on the flop or all in on the turn. We just fold. We have an easy decision. Whereas, um, if we have a more vulnerable good hand, like we have top pair with a medium kicker, um, then you know, then it's sort of a tough decision, right? So we don't really wanna, we don't really wanna be letting, like, if our opponent goes all in, we have a tough decision. We're not sure what to do. And same with like if we have a stronger draw, like say we have a flush draw and we have nine outs and then our opponent goes all in on the flop and we have like 1.6 to 1 odds to call or something. It's, it's a difficult decision. And um, so it, with these hands, you definitely want to, you generally want to bet and raise in a way that allows you to get the last bet in. Because with a stronger draw, you're not, you know, your opponent gets to make a decision, but even if they have the nuts, you still have nine outs. And with a more vulnerable good hand, I mean, if your opponent has the nuts, I guess you're kind of dead, but you're sort of protecting the times you go all in with your stronger draws. So following that principle, I decide to just call here because if I raise, then I sort of have to make a decision when he goes all in of whether to call with my medium strength hand and pretty good draw. Okay, so we call, and the river's an ace of spades, so we completely miss, and our opponent checks to us. So, uh, so we decided to bluff the river for 70, and this is sort of the main decision I want to analyze, and it's, it's going to be quite a complicated decision. So, we're, uh, so, okay, let's do some quick analysis. So, yes, we do have some chances of winning with our pair of eights, so maybe you could make a case that there's no need to bluff, because we do have a pair. But... There's a lot of reasons to bluff. So one is, there's a lot of higher cards on the board now. The pair of eights, it looked pretty good on the flop, but now it's a lot worse after a queen turn and an ace river. So 
you know, we could get him to fold a queen. He could have a queen, and he could very willingly be able to fold it. Um, also, the pot is big. Like, they bet the flop and the turn, and we call the flop and the turn. So sort of both ranges are just very strong because so much money has already gone in. So a pair of eights is not so good. You know, like if you knew he had, he had two random cards, sure, a pair of eights will win a decent percent of the time. But when you know you're up against a hand that was willing to bet the flop and bet the turn, it's less likely the pair of eights is good. And then the ace is always a scary card. And another advantage of bluffing is this is why position is so great, especially when it's deep stacked in the cash game. We're in position and we know that he checked the river. Um, so, you know, maybe he's trapping with like King Jack, but it's more likely than not that it's a sign of weakness that he checked the river. So we could try to bluff him off his hand. Okay, so what about river bet sizing? So, so, okay, so one thing is whether to bluff. Two is if you bluff, how much do you bet? So I decided to bet 70 into 107. And so what are the things to consider when you're deciding your, your river bet sizing? So one is, there's no more cards to come on the river. So in some sense, there's less of a worry of betting really, really small, because there's no such thing as like letting your opponent see a draw. But it still has a disadvantage, like if your opponent checks you and you bet small, it still does give them the option to check raise. So that is one thing you worry about if you're trying to bet really small. And another thing is, you should bet big if your range is polarized. By polarized, I mean you either have the stone cold nuts or you have a bluff. Um, because your opponent, ba if basically if you bet small and your range is polarized, your opponent can just call with a very wide range of hands because their odds are too good. By betting big, you give your opponent worse odds to call, and since you have a stone cold bluff um, some percent of the time, you don't want your opponent to have the odds to call with like third pair. Okay, so uh, okay, so it doesn't matter what they did because uh, our decision is betting seventy. Okay, so now what I sort of want to do is, a lot happened this hand, right? We know they raised the preflop, bet flop, bet turn, checked river, right? So in some sense, we have a ton of information. So in the tournaments that you play, maybe a hand like this doesn't show up that often, because often it's just all in preflop, and you, you can't really deduce that much about your opponent's hand. You know, it's just like he has the top 30% of hands or something. But here, we can actually do a lot of deduction. So... Let's replay the hand from our opponent's perspective and sort of exploitatively put them on a range. So let's like go put ourselves in our opponent's shoes, consider all the actions they did, consider... So I'm going to use exploitative analysis here. So, you know, th there are some flaws with this, right? We are sort of um, arrogantly assuming we're one step ahead of our opponent. We can build a mathematical model for our opponent. But still, this is a useful exercise, even though, yes, there are flaws. You know, maybe he's one step ahead of us. Maybe there's flaws in our probabilistic model. But let let's just assume for the sake of the exercise that we can do this pretty well. Okay. So, first of all, preflop. What's our opponent's range? Um, let's just say, roughly, he's opening from the cutoff. Let's say he's opening about 30% of hands. I think that's about reasonable for like an average player, and I think it's consistent with the guidelines I gave in the first lecture. So, so this includes any pair, any suited ace, any two Broadway cards, which are cards 10 and higher. It includes suited hands as bad as 5-3 suited. Um, this is maybe like one difference between cash games and tournaments, where it is... 5-3 suited is a pretty bad hand in tournaments when it's so short, but when it's 100 big blinds deep, a hand like 5-3 suited is a lot better than a hand like 10-8 off suit. So, um, so yeah, so it includes 5-3 suited, but not like 9-8 off, which is, or like king-7 off, which are just terrible hands when it's 100 big blinds deep. So, okay, so what's our opponent's range here? So they decided to continuation the, bet, the continuation bet into the flop against two players after the big blind check. So, okay, what can we put them on? So, okay, so right, so this is a complicated analysis, and you can't really do this in during the game itself, but it's very useful to do it after the hand. So let's review the factors of why a player would continuation bet, and then consider why he continuation bet. <coughs> Okay, so, right, so this is also sort of a review class. It's the last class, right? So wh what are the incentives for continuation betting? Well, your hand is good enough that it beats most of their calling hands, right? So you're betting for value, or your showdown value is poor, but you have some equity, you have some backdoor equity, you have some overcards or draws, and you're essentially bluffing. Um, another incentive is you're out of position, like he is, and it's not like you can see a free turn card by checking, because I can still bet if he checks. 
So you know, so you you want to bet few opponents. You want to bet um, incentives against continuation betting. One is your hand is so dominant that you need to give him a turn card to hope that he improves. So this is like the trap, the slow play. Um, you have decent showdown value, but not amazing showdown value. So like middle pair. Um, you don't want a continuation bet if you have like zero equity on a reasonably dry board like this one. And there's too many people for you to fold out, or like you're in position and you can see a free turn by checking. So, so there's a lot of things. But so let's look at the situation again, keeping some of those factors in mind. He continuation bet and do ten eight six uh, rainbow, which means three different suits. Okay, so let's roughly put him on. Okay, so actually before I show this slide. Um, What's the, let me think what the best way to do. Okay, I'm going to use the annotate feature and we'll try, sort of try to write on here what hands we think he can have. So this is, this is going to take a while, but I, I plan on spending the next 20, 25 minutes discussing this hand. Okay, so does someone want to say a hand that you think is in his range at this point in the hand? Pretend we don't know what he's going to do on the turn yet. Just at this point in the hand, can someone tell me a hand you think is in his range? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, ace, ace, jack, okay. Uh, yeah, I think that's reasonable. It's actually, I think, a bit weak. But um, let's say, like, ace, jack, ace, jack suited with the backdoor flush draw. Or, okay, I'll, I'll write down ace, jack for now. Okay, so someone want to tell me another hand? Yeah. No, we need to pair maybe nine, ten, then jack suited, or ace, ace, ten. Okay, uh, ace, ten, uh, sure, jack, ten, uh, ten, nine. Okay, um, someone want to tell me another type of hand, maybe? Uh, yeah. Really, like pocket jacks. Okay, good. Pocket jacks. Yeah. So that's a clear value hand. Um, yeah. Okay. Someone want to tell me sort of another type of hand? What about queen jack? Queen jack. Okay, that's a good. Yeah, that's a good one. So queen jack, I think, is like one of the best draws. Oh, maybe not the best draw. What What is the best draw? What would you say? Queen jack of clubs. Uh, queen jack of clubs. Yeah, but queen jack of clubs only. Uh, it, it's not the best straight draw, right? Yeah. What's Jack nine. Yeah, Jack nine. Jack nine or Queen nine. So okay, so I've, I've roughly uh, I wrote some hands here. Okay, Jack nine or Queen nine or like five seven. Okay. Um, One pair of six. <laughs> is it possible? Pocket sixes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah, so I'll write that down. So pocket sixes, good. Um, okay, here's a question. What do you guys want to put him on if he has like a really really good hand? Like, what do you do? You, uh, so, this is open ended. I didn't come with a plain answer. Do you guys want to assume that he checks with pocket tens and like nine, seven, basically the absolute best hands on this board to trap us, or do you want to assume that he bets? Uh, yeah. yeah. I think if he has nine, seven, he'd probably bet because someone might get a better straight if he doesn't bet. Okay, yeah, that's a reasonable assumption. I think it can go either way with, with nine, seven and like pocket tens. Depending on our opponent, um, pocket sixes I think is a clear bet, whereas pocket tens is not because pocket tens you're taking away so many of the top pair hands like, from your opponents, whereas pocket sixes just get so much value when you bet. Okay, so so roughly speaking, you know, I sort of categorize all the hands he could have into five categories. So the first, the top is hands that are so good that he checks to trap or check raise. The second category is like the hands that are good but not that good he value bets. Then it's like medium strength hands that he checks to check call, um, hands that, so this doesn't agree with exactly what we wrote, but that's okay, but this is um, just roughly, and then the next category is hands that he bluffs, and then the last category is hands that he just check folds because they have no equity, like pocket threes, where he would just give up the hand. So we basically crossed off the, these three categories, right? Because with these three categories, he would check, um, whereas the top one, he's checking to trap. The second one, he's checking to hope for a showdown, and the last one, he's checking to give up. And then the two types of hands he's betting are essentially value bets and like draws or bluffs. Okay, so now let's consider the situation on the turn. Um, okay, so so once again, okay, so let's continue. Let's consider his incentives first for betting again on the turn. Sorry, this is a bit hard to read. Maybe I should uh, maybe I should do do it on Notepad. So that it's the annotate isn't annoying. Sorry, just give me a sec. Okay, 
so what are the incentives for betting again on the turn? So one is you bet a good hand for value on the flop, and your hand is still good on the turn, right? So you're betting for more value. Two is you bluffed a speculative hand on the flop, and now you either hit the turn, like the queen helped you, so it's like if you had jack nine, or you improved your draw. Um, or like an overcard to the board came, which was the case, and maybe you thought bluffing the turn could be good. So, okay, so, so he bet the turn. So, okay, so let's maybe put the hands we think he could have into poker stove. So, yeah, I think that's the easiest way to do it. Okay, so let's do this. Okay, so... Uh, Okay, so roughly speaking, uh, can everyone see this? This is easy enough to see, right? Okay, so okay, so let's do this. This is this is so bear with me. Yeah, this is a meticulous exercise, but um, okay. So let's say preflop um, thirty percent. Okay, this is about reasonable. Uh, actually, let me give him a few more pairs. I'll take away a six off. Let's say he goes uh, suited suited connectors down to five four suited. Suited one gappers down to five three suited suited two gappers, um, so su so suited two gappers means like suited cards that are two th three apart essentially, down to like eight five suited, something like this. Okay, something like this is probably probably not, know, let's say he plus ten six suited. Okay, something like this uh, maybe take away like some of the worst off suit hands. Okay, so something like this. Okay, good. So on the flop, what happened on the flop? We said, okay, so let's eliminate hands. What can we eliminate? Right? So this is his entire range of possibilities pre-flop. Okay, so on the flop, we're going to eliminate pocket twos, threes, fours, fives, because he just gives up. Um, pocket sevens and nines we're going to eliminate, because we're going to assume he checks. Uh, five, three, I think, is bad enough. We can assume he gives up. Um, let me just display the flop so that... Let me just dis display the flop so that... We can see. Okay, right. So okay. So what else? Uh, so okay. So let's go through. Let's go through everything. I'll do this a bit fast. But um, so let's see. So okay. Let's say all the middle pairs. He's going to check. So I'm going to remove most of the hands with an eight in them. Yeah. So ace eight, king eight, queen eight, jack. Okay. So ten eight. He's going to bet just because you have an eight. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. So we will take that into account, but. But he could still have an eight, right? So we yeah. still, yeah. But, but yeah, you're right. It is less likely, and we will we will take it into account at the very end. Um, so ace five. Let's assume. Let's assume a lot of these offsuit aces. He gives up because because even with overcards, but with no backdoor flush draw on a dry board, I think is kind of scary to bet. Um, okay, so let's say something like this on the flop. Eight five. Let's go make that. Eight seven. I think he'll check. So 9, 7, we're going to assume he bets. Let's assume he checks pocket tens. Let's assume he also checks some of the weaker, some of the weaker, uh, some of the weaker t tens, like jack ten. Let's let's suppose he checks. Okay, so this is about reason. Maybe ten nine he checks as well. Ten seven he checks. Uh, I guess like okay nine eight nine eight he checks. Um, okay, am I missing anything? Does someone see something that you disagree with? King queen off, king jack off. I think those are too weak to bet into this board. Uh, queen nine, king nine suited, ace nine down here. Okay, I think. Okay, I think this is this is roughly. A, it'll get easier on the turn, basically. Okay, so so let's say this is what he's going to have on the flop. Um, actually, some of these weaker aces probably should be eliminated. Okay, let's eliminate everything down to ace five and below. Ace seven and ace nine will keep in because he has a straight draw. Um, okay. Let, let's see this. Okay, so on the turn, he bets again, right? So, okay, does someone want to suggest a hand that maybe we should eliminate because he bet the turn? Yeah. Any weak dams, I guess. Okay, good. Yeah, I think that's a very good answer, yeah. So let's get rid of ace-10, king-10, because those are no longer good hands. Or they're no longer, I think, hands that you want to really <coughs> continue betting for value, right? Queen-10 is good because it's hit two pair. Okay, um, is there another hand that sort of of a similar category. So I guess pocket jacks is of a similar category, right? It's not as good as it once was. Um, okay, so what are some other hands maybe you don't want to bluff with, you don't want to bet with anymore? Are there any hands you think maybe he would just give up? Because the 6-5... Yeah, I think that's reasonable. I think the hands like, um, 
I think the hand's like most of these. We can assume he's going to give up on the queen, like five four, especially. You know, on the flop.、Uh, so on the flop, he didn't even have a great hand. It was just drawing to a seven. But now it's sort of worse. So yeah, let's get rid of five four.、Um, are there? Do you think they would continue betting like nine six or seven six? Yeah, even seven five is a pretty bad. Is a lot worse after the queen because seven five was like drawing to a nine. Um, but now, when the queen comes, the nine is not a good card because you still lose to a jack. So maybe we can get rid of that one.、Um, do you think they definitely continue betting with ace king, ace queen, ace jack, and all of those? Yeah. If you play an ace queen, they would continue betting it. Like you just pretend I had it all along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So ace queen, I think, is good. All right. So yeah, yeah I think this is about good.、Um, Ace nine, you know, some of these hands I think they would probably stop bluffing with. Like I think Jack seven suited is pretty. Maybe some of the sixes also. I think it's hard to even like Ace seven suited. I think it's hard to continue bluffing because as you see, there's already enough hands with draws, right? Like there's there are already a lot of bluffs here, like King Jack, Ace King,、um, I guess like、uh, Queen nine, nine six, some of these. So yeah, maybe he'll bluff with these. But okay, let's get rid of these.、Um, Okay, so okay, so we've sort of cut down his range a bit. All right, so now it's a river situation, and he checks. So what does this mean? Well, it seems improbable that our opponent would be trying to trap us with this check because、um, he's already been showing plenty of aggression. So it's hard for him to like pretend he suddenly has a bad hand by checking.、Um, and with the pot already so big, he can get a large percent of our remaining stack into the pot just by betting instead of check raising. So it seems like it's less likely he's checking as a trap, and also the ace is sort of a better card for his range than ours because he's the one who's been betting. So you know, having draws, having overcards like aces, and for us, we're much less like likely than him to have an ace. So if it's a better card for his range, he should be betting both for value and with his bluffs. So that being said, so let's suppose we we assume it's. Sort of unlikely. He has a really, really good hand, but he could still easily have a hand that beats ours and calls our potential bluff. So, okay. So now let's go back to poker stove and eliminate some more hands. Okay. So what are some hands we can eliminate after he checks the river? Aces. Aces. Yeah, I think that's a good one. I think aces. Pretty clearly, he'll bet again on the river.、Um, what's another hand? Yeah, King Jack. I think right. So okay, so let's eliminate all the good hands that we think he's going to continuation betting. Right. I think any straight. I think it's reasonable to assume they're just going to keep betting. Like nine seven, even though it's nowhere near the monster it was on the flop. You know, it still only loses to Jack nine and King Jack. So let's get rid of that one. Certainly, like Ace Queen on those. Yeah. So okay. So let's okay. Yeah. Let's do that. So let's suppose. Yeah. I think. Any most strong two pairs, I think definitely he'll he'll keep betting. So let's get rid of that. So let's get get rid of Ace Queen. Let's get rid of Queen Queen.、Um, let's get rid of Queen Ten. I think Queen Ten is good enough.、Uh, Ace Eight. Let's get rid of that one. I think that's yeah, that's good enough. Pocket Eights, Pocket Sixes. I think is good enough.、Um, okay, good. So okay, so we we got some hands here. Uh, basically, all the good hands we removed, right? All the really good hands that he bets again. What What do you guys think about ten eight? I guess it doesn't matter too much. We well, let, let's 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 assume let's assume he checks ten eight because by this river, ten eight is no longer the powerhouse it was. Oh, I gotta get rid of Jack nine. Okay.、Um, what are some other hands you think we can eliminate? So there's actually another category of hands we could potentially eliminate here. Ah,、uh, yeah. Ah,、uh, well, an ace isn't that good of a hand. I don't think it's. I, I mean, right. So this is one problem with this analysis is you know it's it is very subject to debate what we think about our opponent. But for the sake of this exercise, I'd say.、Um, I mean, I also I think in practice, I think it's not clear that you should value bet an ace here because there's just a lot of stuff that beats you, a lot of straights, a lot of two pairs.、Um, I think it, even if you have ace king, you shouldn't really be confident enough in your hand to bet. Like maybe ace king is marginal, but definitely not like ace seven. Yeah. Bluff bets is like weak hands, maybe six four. Great, great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's what I wanted to hear. Yeah. So, so we can also eliminate some of his really weak hands, right? This is crucial. This is an easy thing to miss. We can probably assume he's not going to have king seven because, like, 
the ace is a reasonable card to bluff. You know, it's it's not great. It's not like the ace of clubs, which would be a better card for him to bluff. But if he's got nothing, like if he just completely missed, pr probably. I mean, let's assume you know the, these guys are pretty good players. He's probably going to bluff. So. Let's assume he can't have king. Let's assume he at least has a pair. He has some showdown value because if he had zero showdown value, he would bluff. So let's get rid of king seven. Let's get rid of king nine. Um, six five six four. You know, I think definitely he should be bluffing, but maybe some players will see a pair of sixes and say, "Oh, I have enough showdown value." And so let's get rid of one of them, but not the other. Maybe that's reasonable. So let's get rid of. Two of, so yeah, let's get rid of six four and seven six, but keep in six five and nine six. Um, okay, so we leave ourselves with these. Um, okay, so this seems this seems about reasonable, I think. Um, maybe like maybe we can eliminate. Uh, yeah, let's let's eliminate like a seven. I think a seven is maybe. I think we should have eliminated it on the turn. Maybe like a seven of clubs. We can. Oh no, a seven of clubs. He can't have. But because we have the seven of clubs, um, I think any other a seven other than the a seven of clubs is kind of bad to bet on the turn because it's the seven isn't really that good of a card do uh, isn't that good of a draw. So let's get rid of a seven. Okay, so so let's just suppose it's this. Okay, so okay, Oof, that was a lot of work. Okay, so now. Okay, so roughly speaking, we conclude his range on the river is something like this. Um, so let's assume that he's going to call with top pair or better. Once again, this is you know a pretty strong assumption, but let's suppose this is the way we think he's going to play. He's going to call if he has an ace or better and fold as a rent. So we're risking seventy to win a hundred. And okay, so let's let's do, so yeah, so let's do an exact calculation now of how many combinations of these hands. Okay, so okay, so let's do. I'll do this on Notepad. Um, okay. Okay, uh, let me pull up the board. Okay, so... Okay, hopefully people can see this. Okay, so now, okay, so when I said combinatorial hand analysis, I mean we're going to basically count the combinations. And like you pointed out, this is... Oh, crap, did I accidentally get rid of that? No, that's not good. Um... Okay, let me quickly put it back. So, okay, we had kings left, ace king, ace jack, ace nine, king queen, queen jack, queen jack, queen nine, queen nine, uh, what else? Ten eight, ten six, eight six, uh, we had some sixes, right? Seven six, six five, um, and is there something else I'm missing? Does anyone. Does anyone remember us or something I'm forgetting to check off? Oh, not queen nine off, I guess. I think this is about right. Maybe I'm missing like one or two things. Uh, no one sees anything? I think this is approximately what we had, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. I, hopefully I didn't miss enough that it drastically changed. It, it shouldn't. But, okay, so let's count the combinations, because you can look at this square on the poker stove, and you, oh, uh, let me clear this annotation. Sorry, I should have done that a while ago. Okay, so um, you can sort of see the yellow hands on the square, and sort of roughly see how many hands of each type, right? So there's, there's essentially three types of hands he could have, right? There's, uh, there's hands that call, there's hands that beat us and call, there's hands that beat us and fold, and there's hands that we beat and fold. Um, but the thing is, if you just look at these yellow squares, it won't give you the right probabilities because we have certain cards in our hand. And also, because of the specific way suited combinations work, there's different combinations of each hand. So, okay, so let's go through this. So, how many combinations of ace king are there, ace king suited are there that, so we assumed he had a backdoor flush draw on the flop, but, um, so how many combinations of ace-king suited are possible? Don't worry about the backdoor <laughs> flush draw part. It doesn't matter for this example. So how many combinations of ace-king suited? Well, three. It's just because it has to be suited. And it can't be spades because the ace of spades is on the board. So yeah, so, so it's three, com three combinations. Okay, ace-jack suited. Three, okay, good. 
Um, ace nine suited. Three. Okay, good. Um, all right, pocket kings. Right, so pocket kings is six, because there's no kings, we don't see any kings, and there's no such thing as suitedness. So, so yeah, so one thing you realize in this, oh, so pocket kings, we're assuming he's going to fold. Um, one thing you'll realize in this exercise is you've got to put a lot of weight on the offsuit hands instead of the suited hands, because the, suited, the offsuit hands combinatorially have way more possibilities, essentially three times as many possibilities as the suited hands. So like this queen jack offsuit hand here, has a huge weight in our calculation. That's by far his most likely hand. Because it's the only offsuit hand we're putting him on. Um, yeah, it's the only offsuit. Is it really only the offsuit hand he could have? Um, I guess according to our law analysis, we're assuming the only offsuit hand he could have is queen jack off. So how many combinations of queen jack off are there? 12. Um, okay, sure. Let's just say queen jack in total. Queen jack in queen jack suited plus offsuit is twelve, um, because we see a queen. So there's four jacks, three queens. Three times four is twelve. It could be suited or not suited. So okay, that counts for both of those. What about king queen suited? Three as well. So it's three as well, but I'm gonna put it as two because I'm gonna assume assume if he had king queen of spades which has no flush draw, like no running runner runner flush draw on the flop, I'm going to assume that he would have folded king queen of spades on the flop. So so I'm going to give it two. Um, okay, so which ones haven't we done? Queen nine suited, how many combinations? Three? Mm -hmm. Everyone agrees, okay. Uh, ten eight suited, these get fun. So we're, the reason why 10-8 is suited is because we're assuming he doesn't raise 10-8 offsuit pre-flop from that position. So that's why 10-8 has to be suited. Um, so how many combinations of 10-8 suited? Two. Okay. How many combinations of 10-6 suited? Two as well. Two. How many combinations of 8-6 suited? One. One. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so I didn't, oh no, hang on, I miscategorized this one, so queen nine is in this category that he's folding. These are all the hands that call, call or bluff and beat us. And, okay, so the last category is the hands that we can actually beat if we check it down. Um, so it's very small, right? It's just seven, six suited and six, five suited. Um, okay, so seven, six suited, how many combinations? Uh, two, two, six, five suited, three. Okay. Uh, did I miss anything? I think this is it, right? Okay, so we, we basically, we have to tally it up. So here there's 14. Here there's 23. And here there's five. Okay? And then essentially, okay, so now that we're done this calculation, we need to, we need to basically run the numbers with these calculations. So essentially, roughly speaking, um, they're gonna fold. They're gonna fold more than half the time. Um, so they're gonna fold more than half the time. And so the numbers. I think this will actually come out close because with the way we did this specific calculation, there we. I think we gave them a lot of combinations of hands that we can actually check and beat. But um, I think this is still. This will still definitely call for a bluff. But it is close. As you, if you've done the homework, the homework sort of addresses this, right? It's not just what probability is he bluffing. It's the probability that. Sorry, it's not just the probability he's calling our bluff. It's the probability he's calling our bluff versus the probability we win the hand by checking. And the probability we win the hand by checking is roughly five out of forty-two. Um, so, which is pretty small, and he's, he's folds more than half the time. So, if you run the numbers, you'll see that bluffing is overwhelmingly profitable. And I think this this is this is it's this is a good example of why this combinatorial analysis is good, is because um, if you look at poker stove and you look at this, you might actually think um, you know bluffing is bad because you look at most of the hands, you know, ace king, ace jack, ace nine, ten eight, ten six, eight six. It's hands that. It's hands that call us and beat us. But when you do this combinatorial analysis, you'll realize there's way more combinations of queen-jack than there are eight-six. So looking at this itself isn't quite enough, because this doesn't weight the probabilities of each one correctly. So um, yeah, so this is a good ex exercise to do, I think. Um, even though you know we made a lot of assumptions in our model, but it's a very good exercise to do to after after the fact 
to sort of just analyze what are the different, all the different possibilities. Okay, so I'm going to take a quick break here, and then for the last half of the class, I'm going to, um, I'm just going to talk about some general poker topics, so no math, no poker hands, but just some general stuff about poker, some ending remarks, um, since this is the last time I'm, I'm teaching, since Bill Chen is coming next time. Uh, if you want to join the break, think about any questions you might want to ask me about poker in general, or, or specific hands. Um, yeah. So I'll take like a two-minute break. Make sure you hand in the homework. All right, so I'm going to wrap up with some general thoughts about poker and poker in general. So one question that I get asked a lot is sort of, it's called the moneymaker effect. So what happened, and this is sort of a big catalyst for poker becoming really popular, was I think in 2003, Chris Moneymaker, and that's actually his name, Moneymaker is his last name, um, he won, he spent like a dollar playing in this like satellite on Poker Stars, won a seat to the World Series of Poker main event, and then went there and then won the whole thing for like two and a half million. Um, you know, it was a beautiful Cinderella story, and then people heard this. And also, like, they made it seem like, you know, it's not like the lottery where you got to get really, really lucky to become rich. It's literally, this guy is really smart, he can read people, and it's all skill, and then he, he did this. And it's sort of like, anyone can become a poker star, just like Chris Moneymaker. Um, and this caused, uh, was a huge driving force in the popularity of poker. Um, so a lot, so question that I've wondered myself is, you know, how could there actually be so much money, you know, because someone has to be losing this money for you to be winning this money, right? So, so like, you know, where's the money coming from? You know, how can anyone smart and motivated succeed in poker, etc. So, so, okay, so, and so what's unique about poker? Why is it that, you know, why can't you make this much money playing like chess or something? Why can't you play, make this much money playing hockey? Um, so what's unique about poker? So I guess four unique aspects that allowed for there to be so much money. So I'm going to talk about them individually. One is I think everyone's overconfident, myself included. Two is uh, gambling, self-control, aspects of that. Three is it's a very fast-evolving game. And four is what I sort of started the class, the very first class I talked about being, dis I talked about credit card roulette not being results-oriented. And I think that's very hard. So I'll go through each, of, each one of them separately. So... So yeah, one is this huge overconfidence thing, which is very prevalent. So um, it's it's normal in general for people to be overconfident. I don't know how many of you have seen like the experiment where it's like, you know, write down your 95% confidence intervals for all these things, right? So if they're actually 95% confidence intervals and you're correctly calibrated, then actually 19 out of 20 of your intervals should contain the real thing. But like you do this for a normal person, it'll be like, 30% of their things actually lie in the interval. So they're just <laughs> drastically overconfident. Um, and so yeah, it's normal to be overconfident, but especially in poker, it's, I think poker is among the things I know where it's easiest to overestimate your own abilities. Um, does someone want to suggest any others? Is there something else you think where like, you know, everyone thinks they're good at this thing? So I can think of sort of like two examples that I think are sort of true. Um, okay, raise your hand if you think you're a below median driver. Oh wow, some people actually are willing to do it because I very rarely talk to someone who admitted to being bad at driving. Everyone I've ever asked about their driving skill thinks they're really good at driving a car, uh, myself included. I definitely don't think I have a below median driver. Um, another thing is teaching. I've also, I've also rarely talked to someone who thinks they're worse than median at teaching. Um, <laughs> I guess maybe Professor No, you can see who at this, but yeah, um, but yeah. So, uh, so it's rare. I think you know because most things, you know, someone will admit to being bad at this. But poker, it's 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 similar to like I don't know these two examples I thought of the uh, driving teaching sort of where it's just very easy to think you're really good at it, and and it's hard to admit to yourself that you're not good at it. Um, yeah. So one saying in poker is you know if you're if you can't spot the fish at the table, the fish is like. The, the losing player that everyone is trying to win money from, then like you are the fish. Um, this is sort of a popular saying. Uh, so, 
So why is overconfidence so common in poker? So right. So it's this aspect that it's you know your it's like a mental battle. You're like mentally battling against your opponent. Is he bluffing? Is he not? And it's just easy to always assume, which I do in、um, all, like throughout a lot of this class, right? I talk about exploitative play. I'm building a model for our opponent and assuming that they behave as a probabilistic machine according to my model. I'm assuming that I'm ahead of my opponent. I'm assuming I'm better.、Um, There's also a lot of selective memory. I think it's easy to remember your bad beats, the time they hit a king on the river and beat your aces,、um, and it's easy to forget the times you know you got really lucky on the river and beat them. So selective memory, I think, is a big aspect.、Um, I think lack of clear benchmarks is a big aspect as well. So you know, it's not like running a hundred meters, right? No one who takes thirty seconds to run a hundred meters is going to think, "Oh, I'm I can compete in the Olympics," right? Because it's very clear. There's a very clear benchmark how fast you need to be. But in poker, you know, even if you don't win tournaments, it's easy to blame it on luck. And there's like different types of tournaments, and it's easy to like bench bend the benchmarks in a way to convince yourself that you're better than you are.、Um, It's easy to hit a lucky streak and consider it all skill, and you can blame all your losing streaks on luck. So those are some reasons I think. I think poker is just a very well-designed game for this purpose, into basically tricking, deceiving people into overestimating their own ability.、Um, and another aspect of it is this is, and this is what's really tough about poker. I think is even though it's so easy to be overconfident, and it's such a flaw to be overconfident, it's also in some sense necessary. You know, like. If you're not confident, how can you take risks, right? Like poker, you're you're gambling, and essentially, and you you have to do risky things. And if you're not confident, how can you do risky things, right? And also, like you know, if you're trying to like mentally read your opponent, if you're constantly reminding yourself that you're dumber than you than you think you are, then how can you actually think that you can outread your opponent, right? And like. And I talk about this results oriented. You need to be confident to trust that you made a good decision, even though your result was you lost ten thousand dollars on the day, right? So, so confidence is also necessary, but it's also so easy to be overconfident. So this this balance of being exactly the right confidence is something that I think you know even like. Like professional poker players strive to try to strike the balance between every day, and I think it's very tough, and it's something I struggle with a lot too to try to figure out when I'm being overconfident, when I'm being under underconfident.、Um, so I think one good mentality. So back to this driving thing is I think it's it's can it's a good mentality. You know, if you play poker and you enjoy it, I think it's a great game. It's a beautiful mathematical game and like a fun game to play with friends. You know, if you just Are willing to admit, you know, I play in this home game every Friday night. I'm probably a below average player. I probably lose on average ten bucks every time I play. I think that's totally fine. You know, it's just like spending your Friday night going to see a movie. You pay ten bucks and you're happy to take ten dollars out of your wallet and not see it again, right? You could.、Um, I think it's it, it would be a healthy mentality for more people to be willing to do this and just like you know admit to themselves, yeah, I enjoy playing poker and I lose a bit of money, but you know I have fun doing it. And you know it's the same as seeing a movie, but in reality, I think this isn't the case. You know, if even at these friendly Friday night games for low stakes, probably if you ask all the people there, do you think you're beating your friends? Everyone's going to say yes. <laughs> Everyone's not saying, oh, I'm going there essentially. Paying Friday, paying ten bucks to play poker with my friends. Everyone's saying I'm winning a bit of money or whatever, right? So,、um, so I think that's an important mentality to try to have. That I think poker can,、um, and I think it's fine. You know, if you're if you're not a, you don't have to be the best at everything, right? So.、Um, So one story I like to tell is so David Einhorn he's he's like a billionaire I think he founded Greenlight Capital or something and he he actually won four million dollars in a one million dollar buy-in poker tournament and donated it all to charity so and after the fact you know he's obviously like a super smart guy and he you know so he played a one million dollar buy-in tournament so everyone else playing this tournament is like a poker professional the best in the world and he's just like this rich billionaire who. Doesn't really like he wasn't bad, but he he just started playing poker. He was like you know he's a smart guy and he got coaching to play it, but he's he was cl the clear loser in the tournament. And he just admitted it. He just said you know I'm a billionaire. I'm happy to spend a million dollars playing this tournament. I understand. I'm probably expecting to lose like two hundred thousand dollars or whatever playing this tournament with all these guys, but I'm fine with it. I got a million dollars. Who cares, right? And he was just very honest. And even after he he actually won four million. He didn't come first. He came like third. He just admitted, you know. He said, like, 
you know, I was very lucky. I came in admi- expecting to just lose this $1 million that I don't care about. Um, and then he just donated all his winnings to charity anyway. But um, I, I think, like, I wish more people were like him. I think that's a very good mentality to have to just admit that you're playing poker for fun, and that's totally fine. Um, okay, so the second thing I want to talk about is sort of gambling self-control. So I think this is... Uh, this can also be the downfall of a lot of smart and motivated people trying to get into poker. So, um, it's so one. Th- so yeah. So th- these are some things that can happen, right? So after getting unlucky in the previous hand, you play the next hand poorly because you're like upset, you're tilted, as poker players say, um, or playing when you're tired just to get unstuck. I've definitely done this many times before in my poker career. You know, if I've lost money, especially when I feel like. I've gotten unlucky playing against someone who I'm better than and just like I've lost money because I got unlucky. I like won't stop playing until I get like unstuck, which is like win back the money I'm lost until I'm in the black essentially. And um, you know, it's terrible because even if I'm a bit better, if I'm playing with this mentality trying to get unstuck, I'm just going to be making the low average decisions and it's just not a good thing to do. Um, and also from the other side, you know, it's, it can be hard to rationalize gambling. So, so it's hard to stop yourself from gambling too much, but it's also sometimes hard to <laughs> rationalize that, you know, gambling, there is a lot of stigma around gambling, right? You have to convince yourself that, you know, I can, I shouldn't be too scared. Gambling is, I'm playing this game that involves, you know, you can call it gambling. I'm playing this game with a lot of luck and you got to convince yourself that this is what I'm fine with doing. It's like a lottery. And, you know, you got to sometimes make decisions under pressure as well. And you just got to rationalize to yourself that, you know, yeah, this, there's a lot of luck in this, but this is the game I chose to play. So, okay. The third thing is, um, so fast evolution, I think, is another big aspect of how there was so much money in, in Texas Hold'em for so long. Um, so it was a relatively new game, also with a lot of hidden depth. So something like this could never happen in chess, where chess has been studied for like hundreds, thousands of years, and it's not like a new game. And, you know, even though the best player today is still better than the best player 20 years ago, it's not like the game is evolving super fast. And um, whereas Hold'em was like a new game, at the, relatively new game at the time. And just there was so much hidden depth, and it the best players just kept improving so fast that, you know, so I like to say, like, the best player in the year 2000 would be, like, a terrible player by 2004. And, like, the best player in 2004 would be a bad player by 2008, etc. So it's just, you know, even if you're on top of the game right now, if you stop studying, you're going to be nowhere near the top of the game in, like, a year. So it was just so fast. Can anyone else think of other examples of things that were kind of like this? Um, CrossFit was... When it began, like the winner of the 2009 10 games would wouldn't even compete. Oh wow! Okay, I didn't know that. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, I didn't know CrossFit was like that great. Yeah, uh, that's pretty crazy. Uh, there's one other thing I can sort of think of. Uh, uh, how many of you guys have done like math contests as a kid? I think those, to my knowledge, have gotten a lot harder. Uh, like just in terms of how good you need to be to say be on the United States national team is way harder now than it was, say, 30 years ago, from what I've heard. But, um, but yeah, so this aspect of Texas Hold'em, so this was also a huge driving factor because, you know, like, it, was, it, w- it would be easy to tell yourself, I was the best player in the world four years ago. I can obviously sit down at this $1, $2 game and make money, right? And the answer would often be no. So this was another reason why a lot of people, there was a lot of money in it because you, it's, it's easy to just remember that you were the best a year ago and just forget that the, the, the tides are rising so fast. Um, so that being said, uh, so I wanted to also take this opportunity to suggest some further readings for, I know I've been asked this, yeah. So why is that? Based on your understanding, right? I think because of your strategies, uh, you have to improve your strategy. Yeah, yeah. I also think there was a lot of hidden depth. Um, so, I, I mean, I think with any new thing, this will be the case. But I think for in poker, there there were many times where sort of the consensus amongst the top players was that they were close to solving the game, and then a year later they would realize they missed like 
completely viable strategies that completely messed up all their calculations and they had to start over. Um, so I think that was a big, like it's, it, it was, it's easy to think that you've like solved the game and then suddenly realize, oh, I'm nowhere near solving the game because I forgot about like all of these different strategies. Yeah. Um, I think that's it, but this might be sort of true with a lot of, uh, I'm trying to think, I mean, the, the biggest thing is this, it's a new thing, right? Like it's hard for this to happen in like, I think in most sports that have people have done for a long time, people get gradually better, right? Like you look at like the hundred meter sprint. It's like, yeah, the, the world record is getting broken, but it's not like it's going to go from 10 seconds to like five seconds, right? It'll go from 10 seconds to 9.99, 9.99 seconds to, or, or, or something like that. Right. So, um, I think just the fact that it's new is a big aspect. Um, but yeah, like Texas Hold'em, it would be equivalent, you know, to the world record in the hundred meters being ten seconds, then like five seconds a year later, then like two seconds, like two years. Later. It, it was just insane. Um, okay, so that being said, so some people have asked me, you know, if I want to continue learning about poker, reading poker, um, what what should I do? So so that being said, I think the best resources by far are online. Um, a lot of people have asked me about books, and um, I will recommend some books, but I think. Books basically go out of date way too fast. So I think in general, the best resources are online. Um, so cardrunners.com is a website where basically poker pros can make videos of themselves while, while playing and talking. Uh, it, you do have to pay to get a subscription. So, okay, so this is a bit of a biased uh, advice, just a warning, because I'm a, I'm a pro at cardrunners, but I mean, amongst like 50, 60 other pros. They also donated some free memberships to students in the class. If you guys looked at the prizes, so you can get some free memberships to card runners. Um, a good free resource is two plus two forums. I think there's a lot of garbage on those forums nowadays, but still like most of the best poker players in the world still do use those forums and post on those forums. So two plus two.com, there is a lot of, you know, just like garbage and banter, but if you are just trying to improve, there is good content on there. You just have to find it. Um, and recently, so this is a new thing, but on Twitch streams, so Twitch is like a website you can go on to watch essentially poker pros play in real time. They share their screens and talk through their hands. Uh, it's a pretty good free resource. It's sometimes more entertaining than educational, but um, I think it's quite good. And, you know, they would do like a 10 minute delay so that you can't like watch them and know what cards they have in case anyone was considering trying to do that to get an advantage. Uh, so these are some online resources, and I will suggest some books, although I do think, you know, most of these books, I think, are reasonably outdated, but I do think they're very, in my opinion, out of the books I've read, these are the best written books, and um, even if they're a bit outdated, I think, like, the theory and the way they're written is very good, and also somewhat entertaining, and sort of gives you an idea on the history of poker and the evolution of the game. So... So my favorite book is the first one. It's called Small Stakes Hold'em. Uh, it's by Ed Miller, who's a MIT graduate, David Skolansky and Mesa Melmoth. Um, so this is actually Limit Hold'em, which is in some sense a solved game nowadays, and no one plays Limit Hold'em anymore. So Limit Hold'em is where you, you can't bet any amount. You have to bet a very specific size. Um, but I think this is one of the classic books. In, so this is one of the classic books in poker. It's very well written, written by mathematicians. And it just goes through the basic concepts in poker, I think, very, very well, even though it's for limit hold'em. And it's a good read. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, it might even be a collector's item nowadays. Um, so I, one story I like to tell about this book is, so my good friend Mike McDonald, he was, uh, so he, he's the guy who got me into poker. And he, he would often tell people, he's probably read this book, he says, like, maybe like 20 times. And then he, he's also a guy who doesn't really like reading. So I think there was a point in his life where he's read less than 20 different books in, in his life, but read this specific book more than 20 times. <laughs> um, so it's, yeah, it's a very good book. Um, Harrington on Hold'em is on tournaments. It's outdated. It's really, really badly outdated, but it, I still think it's very well written and has some good concepts. That's how I first started learning to play tournaments. It's Harrington on Hold'em 1 and 2. Um, Kill Phil, Kill Everyone, I think, is a is, is pretty good and pretty up to date. It's 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 decent, I think. Um, Every Hand Revealed is uh, Gus Hansen's a very famous poker player who's been around for uh, forever. Um, it's more so it's 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 a book where he goes through every hand he played in this tournament that he won, 
And I think it's more entertaining than educational, but definitely an, a really good player. Uh, Mathematics of Poker by Bill Chen. It's not that practical. Don't tell Bill this when he comes Friday. But, um, it's theoretically very interesting if you like math, um, if you like game theory. It's theoretically very interesting. Um, Building a Bankroll is a recent book that this year uh, he didn't have any leftovers to donate to our class. But in the past, he's supported our class and donated a lot of the book, a lot of copies of the book. And I think it's pretty up to date and it's, um, it's, it's for cash games, but I think it's, it's very good. Okay, so the last thing is, uh, okay, so back, so sort of back to the four things about poker that I think makes it unique, right? So the, 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 so the fourth one is this idea of not being results oriented. Um, so yeah, so we talked about this a lot in the first class already, this decision mentality and, um, where you need to care about the decision you made, not the result you got. And I think this actually is a barrier to a lot of smart and motivated people getting into poker because it's almost antithetical, right? It's your, um, you know, if you're a smart and motivated person, you're used to like, you know, you study hard and then you get like a good result on your test, right? No one will ever tell, like if you get a failing grade in your test, you're never going to be able to like go up to your parents and be like, oh, I made good decisions, but I just got really unlucky and failed the test, right? Like, no one's going to believe you. So it, it's very, um, it, it, so poker, this can happen all the time, right? Um, so it's, it is a bit antithetical to, to sort of being motivated. Um, yeah, one thing poker players like to laugh at is, I don't know if you like to put, like, the word results-oriented on your resume, I've seen, you know, I've seen like seminars that teach you to become results oriented and like advertise this as being a great thing. You know, you achieve results, you, you work hard, make decisions and you achieve results. Um, but we always laugh at this and just cause results oriented is always a negative term in poker. Like if, if a poker player says someone is results oriented, they don't respect them very much. But, um, but I've seen like resumes that, you know, where people say I'm very results oriented and, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, so another thing, so a, th a related thing is, um, it's easy to underestimate the variance in poker. And, and this is a big aspect too, that go goes along with being results oriented. Um, so there's this like statistical experiment involving making up sequences of coin flips. I've heard of this where, where like a professor would ask students to make up a sequence of 200 coin flips. He would get half the class to do this. And then he would get the other half to actually um, flip 200 coins and write down like heads, tails, heads, 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 tails. Um, and he could tell with like 100% certainty which ones are made up and which ones were real. And the way he did this is basically looking at which of the, uh, what's the longest sequence of heads in a row or tails in a row. And basically, in reality, if you flip 200 coins, I forget the exact numbers, but I think it's something like you're like 99% to get at least like six or seven of the same thing in a row. Whereas in all of the made up ones that people would be like, oh, if it was heads seven times in a row, that can't be random, right? So we can't put seven heads in a row. Um, so I think it's, it's known that it's easy to underestimate how long you can get unlucky for. Like it's easy to think, you know, I've been unlucky the last three times. That means I must deserve to get lucky now, right? But this is like not true mathematically. And, um, it's just very easy to underestimate variance and underestimate how likely it is that, you know, you're just actually going to lose 10 coin flips in a row in poker. It's going to happen to you and, and, um, and you're going to get tilted and it's very important to control tilt. And yeah, pretty much every poker player thinks they're unluckier than mathematically possible. I've definitely felt like this in many parts of my career. I still feel like this sometimes now. Um, it's very easy to get this feeling where you just, you know, how, how can it be possible? How could I actually lose 20 coin flips in a row? Well, <laughs> it can happen. And um, one of my poker players I was talking to, John Tannen, he plays a lot of online poker, and this is actually a picture of his desk. Um, he basically was so angry, I think he, like, smashed his mouse and made a big hole in his desk. So, you know, it, it can really frustrate you. Uh, and, and yeah, so in poker, you know, and I hate to say this, but I think even if you're um, working very hard, you do need some lucky big scores along the way, especially at the start to get into it, even if you're very smart and working in the right way. And this is also antithetical and smart, sorry, antithetical to start and motivate people, right? Because 
we want to believe that if you work hard and you're smart, then you'll make it for sure. But I, I, I won't say this is true in poker. I think I'm, I mean, I think I'm willing to admit. I think I was very lucky at the start. You know, I had some big scores at the start that really drove my interest in the game and really propelled me into professional poker. And I think you know, there, there probably in a parallel universe could be another copy of me that did the exact same things and just didn't get as lucky as I did at the start and just never got into poker.、Um, so. Uh, this this fact that you know you do still need to get lucky even if you, if you make all the right decisions to make it is is sort of a tough thing to、um, is sort of a tough thing to swallow. But、um, you know this is sort of a different story. But I I'd, I'd like to argue that that's sort of true in life too.、Um, you know the fact that being smart and working hard doesn't guarantee success by any means.、Um, So, so although that's that's a negative thing for poker, I like to end you with I like to end with sort of the what I call the joy of making good decisions. So you know, even though you know not everyone makes it in poker, but poker players we like to talk about.、Um, We like to talk about sort of you're not really there. You shouldn't be trying to think about making money or whatever. You're sort of just there to enjoy the game and have an honest opinion on your ability and calibrate your confidence.、Um, I've told the Bill Gates, Bill Brunson story, but yeah, basically, you know, Bill Gates I think was a pretty good poker player for quite a while,、um, and he like he would make money and. Clearly, it was not his best way to make money.、Um, like he could probably just go to his company and make like five hundred dollars a second or something like that. But、um, but when asked about it, Bill Gates would just say, you know, I love making good decisions. I love thinking about this game, making decisions. And even though clearly the money means nothing to me, it's still important to me as a personal goal. To succeed at this game and make money, even though it doesn't mean anything, but so so it's about this joy of making good decisions. And I think part of the reason Bill Gates was able to be quite good was because the money meant nothing to him. He didn't really care about his results and how much he made or lost. Clearly, he just focused on making the best decisions.、Um, And yeah, so it, so yeah, it is true that there's a decent amount of luck in poker, but I mean, yeah. So I would argue, you know, life is luck,、um, and you know, you only live once. There's all these sayings, but overall, the thing to keep in mind is, like Jennifer Shahadi talked about this with the Gold Deluxe video.、Uh, so like, you want to think of your life and or、oh, your poker career or whatever as one long session where you're just trying to make. The best decisions, and even if you don't get the best results today, hope that you get the best, better results throughout the course of your life.、Um, so yeah, so okay, that's that's the end of so yeah, that's the end of what I wanted to say about the general、uh, poker and what I hope you take away from this class from a non-mathematical, non-poker point of view.、Um, I guess there's a bit of time for questions. There's a lot of things I didn't talk about, but I'm happy to answer questions about. So. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions now. Yeah.、Uh, now that there are no longer any class tournaments, where can I go to play to get better and improve?、Um, okay, so I think so. You can. Okay, so there's an MIT Poker Club, and they run tournaments on Poker Stars similar to the way the class works.、Um, The way you can get into the poker club is so Lee Marie is part of it.、Um, she she's like one of the exec. You maybe ask her, send her an email. I can ask her. I can ask. I'll ask her and I'll send something to the class if you guys are interested in continue playing poker on Poker Stars. And、um, yeah, so there's the MIT Poker Club.、Um, and I know in the past sometimes the class I've. The class has continued playing tournaments after the class is over. We would have like a tournament every Saturday or something for people to play, but I don't know if、uh, they didn't last very long. I think people quickly lost interest in it. But、um, yeah, I think just the poker club. Actually,、um, Martin, you're you're in the poker club, right? So you, maybe you can say something to answer that question better. Yeah, so sometimes like、uh, we have home games where people can play like twenty five cents, fifty cents points usually. So like there's like a mailing list. Okay, yeah. So maybe okay. I'll I'll find some information from Lee Marie and Martin, and I'll I'll send something to the class, and I'll give you guys some pointers. Yeah. Yeah. How do you personally deal with downswings? Um. So I guess I've yeah. So I mean, definitely I I've gone through bad downswings and times where I really hated the game. Um. I think I mostly just took a break. So. 
Yeah, I'm, I mostly just took a break. Um, so the first time I had, yeah, so my first couple of downswings when I was first starting, um, yeah, I kind of just took a break from the game for a while, like a month or something, and then came back. That's sort of what I did. Nowadays, I'd say, I, I'd say in like the last four years, I've been, I'd like to think I was fairly good at dealing with downswings. You know, I've sort of went through enough downswings where I kind of was able to just keep it together through it for the most part. Like maybe I'd play slightly less, but I wouldn't quit altogether. Yeah. So for like small cash games online, what kind of edge do you think you have? For and small? Like, and then like what kind of edge, what would be like your like borderline edge where like it suddenly wouldn't become worth it anymore? Oh, uh, I think that, okay. So how much edge I think I have. So it's, so in online cash games, I think it's, the thing is I don't really specialize in cash games, so I never really play them. Um, so I'd say it's probably very little. I mean, I'm sure I can find like a low enough stakes where I'll have a significant edge. Or even in tournaments then online. So in, okay, so in, yeah. Stakes, tournaments. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So in tournaments, I mean, uh, yeah, like I'd say, I, I'd, I'd say there's still, yeah, like a, still a decent, um, decent edge and I'll play it for, but mostly I'd say I'll, I'll play poker mostly for fun nowadays. Um, I don't, I don't, I rarely force myself to do it for making money, I'd say. Most of the time I'm playing, you know, I'm still trying to make good decisions because I enjoy doing that, but I'm not really doing it for the hourly rate or whatever, yeah. Yeah. So what about uh, maybe the best cash game player in the world? How much would they make in uh, 25, 50 cents online? Oh, 25, 50 cents online? Uh, so I don't have a great sense of this, but look, let me think. Um, I think... This could, okay, so the thing is, the, the sort of the, the players who are sort of considered the top players in the world, who play like very high stakes, like nosebleed stakes with like one hundred, two hundred dollar big blinds or something, it's sort of the variance is so high that it's it's not really accepted who's the best because if if it was accepted, you know, someone had a someone had a win rate over someone else, then the guy who was worse just wouldn't be playing. So the only reason those games run is because they all think they have a win rate. So I, it's hard for me to state a number because I'm not going to know better than them what their true win rates are against each other, and they're all going to tell me something different because they all think they're beating the other guys. Um, as far as how much like a really top player can win at like a low stakes game, um, I, it's still it's still going to be very significant. Like I think making something like um, maybe like five or six big blinds per hundred, so that would be. Yeah, five or six big blinds per hundred, I think, is maybe doable at a reasonably low stakes if you're like the, one of the very best. Um, so that would, so by that I mean every hundred hands you make, it, it's quite a lot. It's it's quite generous. But let's say, okay, let's say every hundred hands you make five big blinds. So um, so let's say you play twenty five cent, fifty cent. So if the so twenty five cent, fifty cent, five big blinds is two fifty. You make that every hundred hands. If you play like six tables, you can get in about a hundred. 100 hands per hour, 120 hands per hour. So that's 600 hands per hour. So six, so 600 hands per hour. So it's six times 250. So it's like 15 bucks. But I, I mean, so so it's not a lot. But I mean, those guys can play stakes way higher than 25 cent, 50 cent, and still have a slightly smaller edge. But right. So so if you imagine they play uh, like they play two two dollar two fifty five dollars, then suddenly you multiply the amount they make by ten. Um, I mean, you would decrease it a bit because they they probably wouldn't make five big blinds per hour, five big blinds per hundred. But um, but yeah, it would be higher. Yeah. But I think those numbers are ballpark correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What's like a good strategy for playing at a casino, like exploiting people? Uh, what's a good strategy for playing at a casino and exploiting people? Um, I think. Uh, okay, so I think one thing that's Okay, one general thing that's good to do is you go there, you sleep at night, and you go there at like 7 a.m. and play against people who have been tilted and angry from playing at night, <laughs> and you just woke up at 7 a.m. in the morning, and you're, um, and you're just in such a good mood, and they're on a bad mood, and you can um, win a lot of money. Um, and in terms of like specific, a specific strategy, I think it depends a lot on the player. I think in general, playing tight is pretty good. At least I'd say I consider myself in general a tight player and I think um, a lot of money, a decent amount of money can be made at casinos against recreational players just 
by them getting bored. You know, like at a nine-handed table, you're only paying the blinds one and a half blinds every nine hands. You can easily get away with only playing like you know pocket nines plus ace queen plus. I mean that's extreme, but like you know, if, if they'll probably still call you because they're bored. Like they're not going to think like you know this guy's. I'm going to just fold right. So like one disadvantage of that strategy is they're just always going to fold you. But in practice, I don't think that's like what happens. So I think in general. Playing tight is not a is will always be a pretty good strategy at um, casinos against recreational players. Yeah. Uh, do you have any advice for like avoiding this pitfall of just thinking you're good and you're not actually? Uh, um, <laughs> not really, because I think it's happened to me <laughs> a lot of times. But um, yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, it really is hard to judge. Like, really, the you the thing is, you basic, especially in tournaments, in cash games, it's slightly easier to judge because the sort of you can just look at your data points and it'll like converge faster. Um, in tournaments, the variance is so high you can't really use your tournament results. I think the most important thing for me personally was just talking to players and um, having very honest friends who would tell me if they thought I was worse than someone else and tell me not to play them. And I think that's probably the thing that benefited me the most. Just um, you know, being able to talk to players better than me or like this, as, at a similar level to me and just getting their opinion from them talking to me on, you know, if, if they think I'm not good enough, I want them to tell me. And I think that's sort of the, the, one of the most important things is just getting good feedback from your friends and honest feedback. Yeah. You know, since uh, we can't really play online here and, uh, we can, and we can't do the casino either like every weekend, so we can't play for money. What's some good motivation to keep starting the game? <laughs> um, Are there, is this like poker mentality and the skills we learn relevant in our, our everyday life or in our jobs? Okay, good. So, so yeah. So, okay. So, I'll address a few things. Yeah. So, one thing that I didn't really formally announce, but yeah. So, one thing you pointed out is playing online poker for money is illegal in Massachusetts. Um, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's not, it's, it's illegal, not from like the police can't come arrest you, but it's, Ill but the website will take all your money if they find out you're playing for Massachusetts. But I don't believe it's like, it's written in Massachusetts law or something. I don't believe the, to my knowledge, the police can't arrest you. But, um, but yeah, so the question was, you know, if we can't play online, what can we do? Um, so I think it is legal in New Jersey and Nevada, so you can move to New Jersey. <laughs> um, so, okay, so in terms of, and you don't, okay, yeah, so if you don't want to go to the casino every weekend, um, so what else can you do? So, okay, so what's the motivation to keep playing? So I think I've tried in this class to sort of give examples where I think poker is very useful um, just in terms of, like, related how poker is related to non poker stuff you know like calibrating your confidence figuring out what your biases are and stuff like that so and I also think you know it's it's a fun game it's it's a very fun game it's mathematically interesting but yeah i mean you know if you don't enjoy playing the game much and since you can't really make money playing it in massachusetts yeah then if both of those are true then there's not that much reason to play it um if you don't enjoy it. I think that's just the biggest thing. If you enjoy it and you enjoy the decision making, I think it's it's very fun and it's also very good for you. Thank you. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so if there's no more questions, then I guess, yeah, so I, we'll call it here and then to, this Friday will be the last class. There's two more nights of tournaments left and yeah, I'm excited for Friday for Bill's lecture and to hand out the prizes.